let's start. So thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Amanda, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be in uh, Austin. What's the weather there? I guess the temperature is better than here. Uh, well, so, uh, I think no? it's like 70, so -so? 80 Fahrenheit. I don't know in Celsius. Uh, probably it's it's higher than here. It's uh, becoming to be. So uh, it's an end of the week talk. I hope to be uh, as uh, recreational as I can. Please feel free to interrupt also. Probably, uh, I, I must warn you, probably my girls, uh, two girls, uh, seven and five, might interrupt us during the talk. It's Friday evening, but they, they have a movie, so it should be okay. So we've got one hour. So... Uh, uh, so I will describe this work that uh, we did uh, recently with uh, Matteo Dakile, he's online, uh, Nathanael Enriquez, Ross Lyons, and uh, Meltem Munel, which is uh, a development of uh, something, uh, an idea that we had in a paper, joint paper with uh, Thomas Budzinski and Bram Petri, but I will focus on the on the second one and speak about the first one late in the, in the talk, if time permits. Okay. So the topic is about Voronoi tessellations. And uh, if you're bored by the talk, I urge you to go on this website. Uh, it, uh, it's uh, a 3D representation, uh, no, a, a representation on the sphere of the Voronoi cell associated to international airports. So you see all the black dots, there are airports in the world. And the Voronoi cell, what is a Voronoi cell in metric space associated to a set of points. These are the cells where the point is in question is the closest among all points in the in the set. So if you are a pilot in your plane, and if you have a problem with your uh, engine or whatever, then you better go to the airport associated with the Voronoi cell we are, you are in. OK. And, uh, Again, on this website, you can, you know, uh, the it's a 3D. You can uh, scroll down and so on, make the, the Earth rotate. It's beautiful. But we won't be interested in fixed or deterministic Voronoi tessellation, but for uh, uh, random ones where the points are sampled according to a Poisson point process. So I remind you what uh, a point process, Poisson point process is. So imagine you've got a space E and a measure mu, which in many cases, many case of interest is infinite. And you want to sample a point using this measure. You cannot because the measure is infinite, but you, what you can do is sample an infinite amount of point according to this measure. So you will have a random set of points on your space. So these little stars, they are random. Uh, they are countably many. And uh, so there, there is some infinite part that you cannot see on the left. So usually you, you have infinitely many uh, red stars. And the way they are sampled uh, in this Poisson point process is as follows. If you fix a finite box, so uh, a set which has a finite mu measure, then uh, if you want to describe your points that fall in that set, you first sample a Poisson variable of mean, which is given by mu, the measure of your box. So this gives you a finite random number. And then this random number of points, you will just sample them in your box uniformly for the measure uh, restricted, for the normalized measure restricted in your box. OK, so that's a recipe to construct a Poisson point process, but of course, you may wonder what if what if I uh, take two boxes and then join them together? So there are many ways of uh, sampling uh, a Poisson process in one box by dividing into many many boxes. But the properties of uh, you know when you add two independent Poisson uh, variables of mean alpha and beta, this gives you a Poisson variable with mean alpha plus beta, and this property of Poisson variable makes this procedure. Uh, coherent. Whatever the subdivision of your space you do in boxes, the resulting Poisson point process that you will get on your space has the same law. Okay, so 
If you prefer, well, if you want to sample a Poisson, post, Poisson point process on your space, you just divide it into finite boxes and use this recipe. All right. So now we will be interested in Poisson Voronoi tessellations. So in your space, you will sample Poisson process of points and then consider the Voronoi uh, tessellation. These are ubiquitous uh, uh, objects in stochastic geometry, and they have, they have been studied the, by many, many, many people. If you just Google Poisson Voronoi tessellation, you will find uh, thousands of papers. And uh, just to stick on the ground, I will first focus on the Euclidean case where the space, the underlying space E is R2, endowed with the Liebig measure, and the hyperbolic uh, plane H2, endowed with uh, its uh, uh, hyperbolic area measure. Okay, so you see two realizations of uh, Poisson Voronoi tessellation, which are really different because the space are really different. All right. So what uh, will be the object of interest is Poisson Voronoi tessellation in low intensity. What do I mean by that? I mean that I will sample uh, Poisson point process, PPP in short, with intensity lambda times mu. Mu is your reference measure. And the parameter lambda is a real that will go to zero. And we will uh, wonder what happens to your Poisson point process when lambda goes to zero. So to do that, let's uh, first, oh, I will I will come back to that uh, just after. Let's first focus on the, on the Euclidean plane. So sampling a Poisson point process with a low intensity, just by scaling your measure, that's the same as sampling one point Poisson point process and then zoom in. So let's see what, uh, what you get when lambda goes to zero. So I should say that this is the same in distribution, but this gives you a coupling of all those uh, Poisson point process with varying lambda. So let's zoom in as lambda goes to zero. And what do you see in the limit? Well, nothing. Okay, so if you, if you let lambda go to zero in R2 for your PPP, you will see nothing in the limit. Fair enough. That's not the theorem I want to prove. But let's do the same in a uh, uh, hyperbolic plane. So there are no dilations, the hyperbolic plane, but there is a way to produce the same thing. I will come back to that uh, later on. And the movie you will see is a coupling of a PPP with uh, intensity lambda as lambda goes to zero. Again, it's not a dilation, but you can interpret that roughly as being a dilation seen from zero. It's roughly the same. So let's see. What happens when lambda goes to zero in your intensity? So you see all the blue points of your PPP go away. They go to infinity on the boundary. But for the Voronoi tessellation, something remains. You still see the boundaries. They do not vanish. They do not escape to infinity. And in the end, when all points have been sent to infinity, there is some random object that remains on your hyperbolic plane. And this is the object we want to study. Okay? Do, do you all agree with the movie or you want to see it again? Let's do it again. It's almost a proof. So you send all your points to infinity and in the end, something remains. And this something is random. I will show you uh, several simulations afterwards. C could you say- Questions? What is yes. the what is the the uh, uh, thing that replaces the dilation here? So Was I will come actually. Uh, uh, wait five minutes, and okay. this will be in proof one. Okay. In the proof one or proof two. If if I'm not explained uh, well, then uh, you please ask again. Uh, Nicola, okay. are, are yes? you are you um are you conditioning on on like um. The Vernoy, one of the boundaries of Voronoi cells containing the origin? Not at all. Okay. So there is the pan version. So usually when you want to study those guys, so I will not enter the details, but for those who know, when you want to study Voronoi tessellation, you want to study typical cells. And one very convenient tool is to force, to put one point at zero and to study the cell containing this point. So you force, you put your cell one point at zero. A PPP, a PPP would never put a point at zero precisely, but you put one anyway, and you study the cell containing this guy. 
this is the typical cell or the palm version and it it gives many, many properties of your uh, poisson voronoi tessellation. But if you were to do that in, in hyperbolic uh, plane, then your cell would be bigger, bigger, and bigger. And in the end, you would get nothing. Because since you placed one point at zero, uh, eventually the, the, all of the points would be at infinity and the cell, contain, the cell of zero would contain your whole hyperbolic plane. So I'm not considering the palm version. That's key. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the question. So I'm not sure if this is necessary given the audience, but let's proceed anyway. So uh, just a crash course on the hyperbolic geometry. I will most of the time stick with the hyperbolic plane, but uh, I will tell you uh, generalization uh, later on. Um, most of the drawings or simulation that I will present, they use the disk model of the hyperbolic plane. So it's just the metric space you get when uh, when you're close to the boundary, epsilon close to the boundary, you multiply locally the distance by the factor uh, one over uh, epsilon. And um, so it, this blows up near, near the boundary. And for example, a point which is epsilon close to the circle is in fact logarithmically far from the origin. In this model, lines are a piece of uh, orthogonal uh, circular arcs. Uh, the volume growth also, so there is a natural measure, which is just the Liebig measure multiplied by uh, this factor, one over epsilon squared. And this makes an exponential volume growth. So if you look at ball of radius R center at uh, zero, say, or any point, then uh, it grows like e to the r. It's not exactly, but it's very close to e to the r. Um, the isometries, so th this is a metric space, and the, the isometries for this uh, hyperbolic metric is just the Möbius group. These are uh, homographies that preserve the, the, the disks. Uh, in particular, it's transitive. You can send any point to any point. And final piece is the, those... Uh, cycles that you see touching the boundary, those are called the Oro cycles. What, what do they uh, represent? We will come back to that in a minute. Okay. So let's present the theorem. Once again, the movie. Nice. Okay, so here's the theorem. So uh, illustrating the movie. So as lambda goes to zero, when the intensity is vanishing, the poisson voronoi tessellation on the hyperbolic plane converge in distribution Again, in the movie, there, there was a coupling for all lambdas, so the convergence was, in fact, almost sure in the movie. But uh, uh, if you sample different realization for different lambda, it's just in distribution. If you want to be uh, very really rigorous, the, the convergence is locally for the house of topology. And it converges towards a limiting tessellation that we call the pointless or ideal Voronoi tessellation. And it has very nice properties, as, as I will try to uh, show you. You see here a couple of realizations of this um, pointless or uh, ideal tessellation. So there is a glitch in one of them uh, in the middle here. Uh, there should not be a point with, well, but anyway, you see a couple of realizations of this random object. OK, so first, I will convince you that this is not at all a, a difficult proof. Once you get the idea of the theorem, the proof is just a few pages. Uh, but before that, let me tell you that the methodology is in fact very robust and it works virtually for any, uh, any space where you have exponential volume growth and non-trivial uh, Gromov boundary or Busman boundary. I will show you that. For example, it works exactly uh, mutatis mutandis for a higher dimensional hyperbolic space discrete trees. And in fact, this was uh, already uh, studied by a student of uh, Ross Lyons, but uh, the, this was not published on any studies. And it works uh, in the work of uh, Amanda and his collaborators for product of trees and uh, product of high public spaces and, um, and symmetric space for higher uh, rank, uh, uh, semi-simple groups. But I will stick to uh, hyperbolic uh, uh, space for this talk. Okay. So the first ingredient is to 
uh, understand the, those distance function. So the key ID, so remember what we want to uh, prove. We want to prove that as the intensity is low, all those points of your PPP, they go away to infinity, but still the Voronoi tessellation produce something random near the origin. That means that near the origin, you see interfaces of your Voronoi tessellation. And the key idea is to say, oh, if you want to understand the Voronoi tessellation, you don't need to understand distances. You just need to un understand difference of distances. Huh? You just need to, to decide to which cell you belong to. So you need to understand difference of distances. And there is a very uh, elegant idea uh, in uh, geometric, uh, metric, metric geometry, which is this idea of Gromov, Gromov boundary. So you see any, any space E, uh, you embed any space, metric space E in this, uh, this uh, space of continuous function of uh, over E by saying that a point X is just the distance function to X. Okay, so x is mapped to dx. What is dx? It's just the function that uh, measures distance from x to x. But if x is very, very far, this distance function blows up at zero, and we will always pin those uh, functions zero at zero. So we just subtract the distance uh, from uh, x to zero. So what is this dx? dx is just the distance function to x, which is uh, with a random with a shift so that it's zero at zero okay and once you do that you have an uh, you can you can inject your space e into this bigger space and take the completion for the topology of uniform convergence over every compact and if you do that you actually add some points which are called or of functions and which measure in a way distances from a point that would be at infinity. And this function that you add, they are called or of functions and the point, this theta, are these uh, points on the boundary of E. So in, in our case, theta will just be just the circle. Why? Because if you take a point, so you see one point uh, on the left here in a hyperbolic plane on the left, and uh, these concentric, not concentric, but concentric for the hyperbolic metric circles are just the level lines of, your, or the, of the distance function to x. And you see that if you send x close to the boundary, those distance function, they become uh, circles which are tangent to the boundary in the Euclidean sense, okay? So if you prefer, that's just what is written above. When you take a point X and you send this point X to the boundary, if you sit at zero, and if you look at what is this distance function dx when X is going far to the boundary, it just converges uh, towards one function that would measure the distance to the angle theta, and which is the function that, whose level lines you see on the right. Okay? Is that clear? So these are the oral functions for the hyperbolic plane. Okay, second ingredient of the proof, we want to understand um, what is going on with this PPP of points when the intensity lambda goes to zero. So what we will do is, uh, now, I, now I will answer the question that has been asked a couple of minutes ago. So first I will order all my points by their distance to zero, from zero. So zero is my reference point in my hyperbolic plane. I have this PPP of points and I order them from distance to zero. So this is Xi of lambda. How can I sample those guys? Well, by, by the Poisson mapping theorem, I know that if I if I have a Poisson point process, if I map them through a function f, then I get a new Poisson point process whose uh, intensity is just the push forward of the initial measure by this function f. Here, my function f is just measuring distance to zero. So I know that in the end, if I see my points through this function, I get a Poisson point process on R plus whose intensity is the push forward 
and by just a Poisson process calculation, I can write those distance as being f minus one. What is f? f is just the volume growth, so it's almost exponential. It's not exactly exponential, that's why uh, I put f. And then I put a Poisson point process with intensity lambda or lambda on R plus, and this I can write it as a standard Poisson point process on R plus. You know, it's the uh, points that you put on R plus so that in between each point, you've got an exponential, uh, independent exponential random variable. I scale everything by one over lambda, so the points are really stretched, and then I take the inverse by f minus one. And you see that in this, in this uh, thing, this works for one lambda. And so this is true in distribution for one lambda. And so I will take one P, PPP on R plus, which is this PI, once and for all. And I will use the same one stretching by one over lambda and taking F minus one inverse. This is how I couple my realization for different lambda. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. It um so but in the in the pictures you were actually just moving the points away from the origin is that right i still, i still need the angles and it's coming look at the last line the last line the angles of my points by rotational invariance angle of my points they are just independent iid uniform angles so they are uniform angles on the uh uniform directions if you wish and then the their distance to zero is just given by this f minus one of uh, one over lambda times the ith point in my ppp on r plus okay if i do that then they are all coupled for any lambda the the directions the angle are fixed and just they are moving away to infinity using this function and my goal now is to prove that once they are coupled that way my tessellation converges for sure, deterministically speaking now. So the first remark is, I told you that the volume growth is almost exponential. So let's pretend it's exponential. It's not a big deal here. So uh, what is this F minus one of uh, lambda inverse PI? It's just log of one over lambda, which blows up, plus log of PI. Log of PI is just one random variable. So the distance to zero, they blow up like log of, of one over lambda, but then the correction is just an additive random variable. That's very important. Okay, so we will remember that. And now we want to, we are sitting at zero or at y, if you wish. Y is just a point in the neighborhood of zero. And I have my points which are really far away, but I want to decide which point do I belong to, uh, to which point uh, I, I am the closest? So I need to find what is the I or J so that I'm clo closer to, okay? So it, those points are very far away. So those two distance on the left and on the right, they blow up. But if I subtract log of one over lambda, I also subtract uh, and add the distance to zero. Okay, so I, I add the distance to zero, I subtract it, and I subtract on both sides this log of uh, one over lambda. What do I get on the left? Then on the left, when lambda is really small, I see that I remove the divergence in the log of one over lambda, and so I just have log of pi, and the dy uh, to xi and d minus d0 to xi is converging towards this oro distance, d theta y, d theta i of y. Okay, and these are just numbers. They are not blowing up anymore. And now I just have a question. I have i and j. I compute what I see on the left with this d theta i of uh, at uh, y plus log of pi. And I need to decide whether it's uh, larger or smaller than d theta j of y plus log of pj. Then you may say, oh, but uh, I have many, 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 many points. My i is countable. i uh, goes one, two, two. But this log of pi is increasing, right? Because the ith point in a Poisson point process on R plus is roughly at distance i. So log of pi is roughly log of i. And so I don't need to check 
infinitely many inequalities because because if I take a point y, okay, this d theta uh, of y is a finite number, and so I will never check inequalities with a j which is very 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 far, okay. So just finite number but random of inequalities to check, and I can decide to which cell the point y belong. Okay. So this should convince you in two lines that cells are converging. But it's a little delicate because as far as I told you, the cells, they are described by checking those inequalities, okay, for any i and j uh, to check to which point, uh, to which cell do I belong, where I remind you that the theta i, they are just independent angles and the pi, our uh, arrival of a standard Poisson point process of R plus PI is roughly I. Okay, well, but that's a little abstract, right? It's work for many space, but it's abstract. Let's put uh, our hands in the machine for the hy hyperbolic plane and use a little uh, hyperbolic geometry. Uh, I remind you what is the Poisson kernel. The Poisson kernel is this function. So it's a function that uh, associated to a point on the boundary, theta, and a point z inside the disk, a number, which is this number. What is this number? This number can be interpreted as put a light in the disk at point z and measure what is the flux of light that you see at point at, uh, on the circle at the uh, angle theta. So for example, if z is put in the middle, then the flux of light you see for any theta is constant. You see in the formula. But if the point Z come closer to the boundary, then the flux of light that you will see uh, at, uh, at an angle which is uh, in the direction of this point Z is higher. And this increases, of course, if the point Z is close to the boundary. Okay, This is what uh, the Poisson kernel is telling you. For the probabilists in the room, this is also just the density of the harmonic measure uh, seen from uh, on the boundary seen from point Z, or the equivalently the the law of the hitting first hitting time for a Brownian motion that would be uh, started at Z and uh, freezed when touching the boundary. Why? Is that a key quantity because it's conformally invariant, so it blows up. It blows up. It pops up everywhere in the hyperbolic geometry. It's really a key quantity. I will spare you the calculations, but using this uh, Poisson kernel, you can actually put your hands in what is exactly this Oro function d theta i of y. Do a little calculation that you can abstract if you like uh, this conformal mapping stuff. And you get that to check the inequality on the top, you just have to check the inequality in the bottom, which is a Euclidean now inequality. The point Z belongs to the cell of point I if PI, which I remind you again is roughly I, Z minus theta Euclidean distance squared is less than the same quantity for the, the, the point J. Very simple, right? So now if you want to simulate, you can very easily. Okay? So let's use this formula to prove one property uh, of the cells, which is true for a hyperbolic uh, space, but not for product of hyperbolic space. Huh, Amanda, that's, that's key for you, but not for us. Uh, we, we were just for hyperbolic space, not product of hyperbolic space. And which is the theorem that uh, all cells are one-ended. They have one end. What do I mean by that? So let's step back. We have this limit of uh, Voronoi uh, tessellation. So we have this ideal tessellation. And now let's take the point zero and let's see uh, what is the cell containing this point zero in the limit. So of course, almost by definition, the first ideal point, which is this theta one P1, P1 is the delay. This theta one P1 is 
by definition, the point that will be the closest to zero, by definition. So we know that the line going from zero to this theta one, uh, to this theta one, this hyperbolic line, will be in the cell of zero. So you have one end, you have uh, this cell is infinite and extend to the boundary to theta one. The question is, 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 is this the only line in your cell? It could be very well be the case that there is another line that you see on the drawing going to the right to another point on the boundary theta uh, prime. Could, could it be the case? Ah, if you would uh, uh, this guy here, if you would, would have uh, an arm stretching to the boundary on the right, that means that you can find a point Z in the cell of zero that is very, very, very close to another point on the boundary theta prime. Okay, so let's consider this point Z, which is at an angle theta prime, which is not theta one. Then I use the inequality I have before. By definition, if theta one P one is the point which I'm the closest to, that means that for all points J, I must have the inequality which is down here. So P1, which is a number, let's say one. So Z minus theta one, Z minus theta one is just a number, let's say four. So I have four on the left-hand side, must be less or equal than PJ, which is J, times Z minus theta J squared. Aha. So if this point Z say is epsilon close to the boundary, epsilon close to the boundary, what do I get? I get that epsilon squared, this Z minus theta J is epsilon squared. Epsilon squared times J <coughs> should be lower bounded by four. So I cannot have one of the first points on the boundary, one of the theta J, one of one of the one over epsilon squared first point cannot fall in this little region that you see in blue. Again, I sample those angles uniformly at random, one, two, three, four, five, up to one over epsilon squared, and none of them should fall in this little region. But this little region has a mass area epsilon. So if you sample one over epsilon squared point, what is the probability that none of them fall in this epsilon region? It's exponential in minus one over epsilon. It's really, 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 really tiny. It's exponentially small in epsilon, in one over epsilon. So then you can use a covering argument and say that this will never happen. And for sure, you will have one point uh, um, um, preventing you from going this arm to uh, to the boundary. Okay. All right. So cells have one end. Another property which comes from free comes from free is the Möbius invariance of the tessellation. Möbius invariance in low. Why? Because the tessellation at lambda fixed, the Voronoi tessellation at lambda fixed is Möbius invariant, and so the limit is. So that uh, enables you to study nice dynamics, all uh, you, you take your favorite uh, dynamic uh, using Möbius maps, and you, 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 you move your tessellation according to these Möbius maps, and you know that this is a, a continuous process with values in tessellation, which whose law is uh, always the idea tessellation. We have not studied it, but we can. Uh, now it's the time for beautiful formulas. So as I told you, many people have studied the uh, poisson voronoi tessellation for finite intensity lambda. And so we are uh, lazy. We take the, their formula for lambda. We send lambda to zero, and we prove that uh, it, we can do that. 
and we get very nice formula for the uh, intensities. What do I mean by intensities? So there are two types of intensities we can consider. These are the counting intensity on the left and the integral intensity on the right. They are defined as follows. Um, for the counting intensity, I, D, K, D is the dimension of the hyperbolic uh, space we are in. So starting from now, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not on the hyperbolic plane anymore, but uh, hyperbolic space of dimension D. And I take K, which is a number between uh, zero and D minus one. So I have this tessellation and this tessellation has points, points that are cells of dimension zero. You have lines, lines are uh, cells of dimension one. You have uh, polygons, hyperbolic polygons, dimension two and so on and so on. And the counting intensity is defined as follows. You fix a region A, whatever the region, and you count the number of K faces, face of dimension two, K that you see in this region. So to be really specific, you need to, for each face, to fix a point. For example, for a point, it's just the point itself. But if you had an arc, take the middle of the arc. If you had a polygon, take the barycenter or stuff like that. And you say that uh, a, case, a face will intersect A if this distinguished point is in A. I told you that this does not depend on A by uh, translation invariant, by Möbius invariance, but you need to normalize this by the measure, the, the d-dimensional measure of A. You can do exactly the same, but instead of counting all the, all the faces that will intersect, that the distinguished point will be in A, you just count how much of the k-dimensional hyperbolic measure of your face is in A. So for example, if you have a line, if you have a region, you just count what is the length of your segment that is present in A. Again, you normalize by uh, the measure of A, and this does not depend on A. Well, those numbers you see on the tabula here, we can compute them by uh, taking a paper of Isokawa uh, in the 2000 for the integral intensities, and a very recent paper of uh, Goodland, Kablushko, and Taylor for the counting intensities. Very nice numbers. And I urge you to remember that I tilde 2, 1 is 2 over pi. Just, just to notice. I tilde of 2, 1 is 2 over pi. Nota bene, 2 over pi is less than 1. OK. So those are the numbers for dimension two and three, but in general, we have this ugly or beautiful formula as you, as you prefer. I remember, remind you the definition of the uh, counting intensity. Then you define this function C of A, which is a nice function. Then I D V of D, which is an even nicer function. And the wonderful function J of D K, I cannot uh, pass the formula, but it is here just uh, for your pleasure. And then you got this uh, wonderful formula for the counting intensity. Okay. Is this uh, related to like L2 Betty numbers or something? Uh, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> Uh, to me, uh, well, the, the way <laughs> we proved it is we, I at least, is uh, I, have, I don't have the, the sufficient power to do this calculation, but as, as I told you, these have been done for any lambda by these people, and these uh, were involving the functions, and we just take their results and send lambda to zero. I see. So, so the, the function for me pops up already for a finite intensity lambda when they want to compute the counting intensities. But you might you might be right, but I, I cannot tell you. Okay, and to finish, I want to tell you a few uh, nice uh, distributional identities on the cell containing the origin. So again, 
So you've got a portrait of the cell containing the origin for many realizations where I always put on the left-hand side, the first point, you know, the theta one, I put it at minus one just uh, to align all those cells. So you see that the cell is random because the tessellation is random, but this is, this will play the role of a typical cell because by translation invariant, any almost sure property for the cell of the origin will be shared by all the cells of uh, our tessellation. So we want to study the, the property of this guy, cell of the origin. So you see that in dimension two, the cell of the origin is just an infinite convex polygon with a unique end, as we, uh, we, as we said. But we want to understand, as you approach the boundary, can you describe this cell? <coughs> Here is a very nice realization of the cell containing the origin, but in H3, hyperbolic uh, space of dimension three. So the cell containing the origin will now be a polytope, hyperbolic polytope with an infinite number of facets uh, accumulating at the unique end. It's rotating. And if you are interested, you send an email to Matteo, he's online, he can print it with a 3D printer for you, uh, modulo a few dollars. So you, you see on the simulation, the, the unique end. So those are the, the big facets and the unique end is this hole that you see in the simulation up. There is no hole, but this is the unique end of the cell. Okay. so. Here is the theorem. It might be complicated, right? I told you I, I take a Poisson process of small intensity lambda goes to zero on hyperbolic space. Then I take the cell containing the origin. I get this the convex polygon. It might be very complicated, but I can describe it for you. Uh, the proof is, is really easy. It's just mapping theorem for Poisson process. But the recipe is appealing. So here it is. Imagine you let, you, it's a deposition model. So to describe this convex polygon, we will send its unique end to infinity and we will work in the upper half plane model now. So that once you send this unique end to infinity, you have something that spreads on Rd minus one. Okay, and it, it can be described as a function on Rd minus one. Well, this function is just a complement of a random collection of half spheres. That's the theorem. And this random collection of half spheres is just a Poisson process with intensity that you see here. So there is a random intensity E. Let's forget about that. There is a, an indicator here is just to, to be sure that the point zero is really in your cell, but let's forget about that. The, the two important features is that you let the centers of the sphere on Rd minus one fall according to Liebig measure, dx. But the radii, they are given by this infinite intensity, which blows up for small radii. Okay, when rho, the radii rho is small, this blows up. So you will have many, many, many small half spheres falling on, your, on the ground, many, many small ones, and big ones sometimes. And then you let them fall in your garden and see what is above. What is above is, is describing your, your, the cell of the origin. So it, it is more uh, visual in uh, 3D. So what you see here is the cell, the, the jewel that you see in red. You project the unique end to infinity. You, you, you have this uh, foam, this mousse, this uh, uh, this random function on R2. And this random function of R2 is just what you see after letting those half spheres independent falling on the ground. And you see a foam like that. So since it has a very simple description, we can do very simple calculation. This is, these are calculations that we actually did in the paper. Uh, 
not not uh, taking the actually we could have taken uh, I'm not sure this was calculated for fixed lambda but anyway we, we could uh, probably do the computation for fixed lambda and let lambda go to zero but these are actually calculations we did directly in the limit what is this uh, what are those functions these are the whole probability this is the probability that the point zero is a distance at least u from the boundary of its cell. So if you prefer, this is the uh, tail function for the, for the random variable, which is distance of zero to the boundary of its cell. And you have very nice and very explicit formula for uh, dimension two, three, and so on. Voilà. I let you stare at them. Final calculation that we can do is um, so again, this is the form. This is this uh, deposition model in dimension uh, two or, or higher. You see a tessellation here, right? If you see your, your uh, form from infinity, there is another tessellation, a Euclidean tessellation on Rd minus one that you see, right? You see it already projected here. Let's rotate it with the, those straight lines. Huh? You see what I mean? So you have those spheres, but seen from infinity, the intersection of those spheres, they make straight lines, which is not, not a Poisson process, but which is a Laguerre process that has been studied by almost the same authors. The last two are the same, but not the first one. Guzakova, Kabluchko, and Taylor. Also last year, and they were studying precisely uh, a family of models that encompasses this one. So we can use their formula. And we have, again, explicit uh, explicit formula for all the counting intensities of this, um, this tessellation. OK. I still have five minutes, right? I can describe that. So this is not exactly an application of, uh, of the of what I told you in this paper, but the, the first theorem that uh, we got with Thomas Budzinski and Bram Preti was actually uh, the, the work that uh, uh, started for us, at, uh, at least the, the study of those guys. We were after uh, studying the Chigger constant of uh, hyperbolic surface and proving that the Chigger constant cannot be close to one for very uh, large genus, that there is a gap that you cannot get a hyperbolic surface with a Chigger constant as close to one as you wish. And we prove that actually you cannot beat two of a pi. We, the bound is not optimal for sure. But what is this two of a pi? Two of a pi actually in the proof comes as the in, integral intensity of uh, the um, of uh, lines for the ideal poisson voronoi tessellation in the plane. And I also mentioned this beautiful uh, theorem of Amanda and co-authors, where they use also, not at all, uh, they, 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 they are not using the paper, but they use this idea of uh, taking ideal tessellation to prove this beautiful th theorem of fixed price one for uh, higher rank semi-simple uh, reality groups. And there they use a key uh, idea. Their key idea is that on this uh, symmetric space or product of a hyperbolic space, then the geometry of cells is really, really different. And, uh, uh, and there you don't have one unique end. Actually, two cells will be, uh, any two cells will be adjacent on an unbounded region. And they use this as the key um, geometric insight uh, from this ideal uh, uh, Poisson Voronoi uh, tessellation. So it's a teaser to uh, knock on Amanda's door and uh, and get more on that. That's all on my side. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, are there questions for Nicola? Uh, this this might be um, a bit naive, but. Is there uh, anything that happens if you send the intensity to infinity or do you just get everything turns into so, good? Actually, 
this was studied way before us. On hyperbolic space, if you send the intensity to infinity, then locally, you become Euclidean. If you send many, 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 many points on hyperbolic space, then if you zoom in, what you see is almost the flat metric. Hmm. So this this was studied by um, many people, and including uh, Nathanael, which is uh, in uh, in our group, Nathanael Enriquez. So you've got various development for uh, geometric properties of the cell. As lambda goes to infinity, those quantities they approach the Euclidean ones, and you can uh, you can get the error terms and so on and so forth. So it's a very interesting question, but totally orthogonal to to what we're doing here. So when lambda goes to infinity, you become Euclidean. When lambda goes to zero, you stay hyperbolic. Thanks. Could you go um, back one slide? So um, in the top theorem, uh, there, there's nothing random in that statement. So are you saying that's, well, that the... There is nothing random in the theorem, but there is randomness in the proof. You, you've got good eyes. So Well, yeah, it's, it's the same for Amanda's theorem. Huh? The theorem is not random, huh? For for oh yeah that's true too yeah, <laughs> um, it, can you say anything about how you can how you can actually yes. bound a yes, cheek? I, I can tell you. The, yeah, I don't want to say because the, the proof is disappointingly uh, disappointingly simple. The oh. okay, uh, uh, it's a uh, it's a joke, but. Uh, not entirely joking. So the you want to you want to bound the Chiga constant of a surface. You take a surface in very high genius, and imagine, for example, that uh, the C stall goes to uh, goes to infinity, so that locally your uh, surface, your hyperbolic surface, is locally like the hyperbolic plane, right? You want to bound the Chiga constant from above, so uh, you want to split your surface into two piece with a small boundary in between them, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And this was done, this was done uh, for the graph case back in the eighties by Bolobash, Alon, and uh, there's a lot of uh, very nice work on that. And the idea there in graph theory was when you want to split your graph in two parts, just color the vertices black and white uniformly with a coin flip and use this as your decomposition into two parts. This is really crazy, right? You, you don't use anything about the surface or the graph. You just don't use anything. You just split it at random in two parts. Okay. For graph, it works. You have to sweat a little bit and it works directly. For surface, you cannot, for any point, sample a black or white because there are uncountably many points. You cannot do that. So you want a way to split your surface into two parts, black and white. And our idea with Thomas and uh, Bram was to say, oh, we will first sample points on the surface. Then consider the Voronoi diagram it produces. This gives cells for you. And okay. then we will color those cells black and white with uniform probability half half. And this will split our surface in two parts. Oh, okay. Incroyable. Incredible. And then, and then we do that as lambda goes to zero. So we sample very few points, if you wish, on the surface so that these cells, they are very, very large. And then by computing what is the isoperimetry in those cells, we get the result. Wow. I will not do the same for uh, Amanda's uh, theorem. So if you if you have a question, <laughs> she describes it for you. <laughs> <laughs> I would also say like it, it's uh, it's surprisingly simple as well. Like with with the once you have the ideal Poisson Voronoi tessellation. Hmm. Do, do you have other uh, do you have other conjectural applications of uh, you know to high genus surfaces? 
uh, it, it, the question is, am I writing another paper using those stuff? Uh, uh, not as striking as those two uh, beautiful results, no. But who knows? Do, do, do you know if um, the uh, ideal boson Fournoy tessellation is a factor of IID? Like, is it a factor of Poisson? Yeah. Yes, yes, it is. Oh, yeah. yes, it is. It and, is. And, it's, and it's simple. Oh, okay. I mean, I know it's a limit of factors of Poisson, but is it actually a factor of Poisson itself? It's it's uh, the way you construct it from a, from a Poisson process on the on the ideal boundary cross R plus. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah, you first need to say there is a Poisson process on the on the what we call the Corona, which is the ideal boundary cross R plus. Then uh, and then once you get this guy, it's pretty clear. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank Nicola again for the excellent talk. Thank you. Very nice. Talk. Thank you. That was really cool. <laughs> yeah. Have a good afternoon. Yeah, good, good evening. <laughs>